George, El- George Eldon Ladd far overshadowed any other single scholar of any millennial perspective throughout a full career of defending historic premillennialism as the form of eschatology that actually became the unifying motif of New Testament theology more generally. Countless evangelical New Testament scholars and systematic theologians, many of them little known, but also other major commentators on Revelation or theologians specializing in eschatology have more or less adopted Ladd's perspectives. The post-tribulational rapture. In our volume of 2007 conference papers, Rick Hess demonstrates the consistent Old Testament and especially prophetic pattern of God's people having to undergo suffering before full redemption. This makes the idea of Christians escaping the end times horrors seem inconsistent with previous patterns of God's activity in human history. Alain Dallaire shows that the belief in an earthly golden age in Israel's future, not yet equated with the eternal state, was also a common in ancient Judaism. Together, these observations support historic premillennialism from the Old Testament over against dispensationalism in the first case and over against amillennialism in the second. In my, that is Craig Blomberg's chapter, I, that is Craig Blomberg, turn to key New Testament texts. The all that discourse is again crucial. That Jesus warns His disciples and not His opponents to watch for the unfolding tribulation which we identified two days ago with the church age but which Revelation later adds will culminate with what we might call quote, the great tribulation at the end of overall tribulation, end quote, suggests that believers will be alive throughout. The verse in this discourse most commonly used in defense of pre-tribulational rapture, in fact, better supports a post-tribulational view. Immediately after stressing how no one can know the timing of the end, Christ adds that it will be like the shock the people in Noah's day received when the flood actually came for which only Noah and his family had been preparing. Matthew 25, verses 37 and 38. Jesus continues, quote, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. End quote. Verses 39 through 41. Although the Greek, Greek verb for take in verse 39 is not identical to the one used in verses 40 and 41, they are close synonyms in this context. If the flood took the people of the earth away in judgment, leaving only those on the ark to be saved, then Jesus' disciples would assume that the man taken in the field and the woman taken from their grinding would also be taken away in judgment. Those left behind are those who are saved, just as Noah and his family were left behind to repopulate the earth and not destroyed in the flood. There's no secret rapture here. If there is any hint at the rapture, it would be to a post-tribulational timing. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 contains the only text in the Bible that actually refers to believers being, quote, caught up, end quote, to meet the Lord in the air. It is from the Latin translation of the Greek word, verb for, quote, caught up, end quote, that we get our English word, quote, rapture, end quote. Literally, we are caught up, quote, for a meeting, end quote, with the Lord. The Greek word for meeting Apontesis is often used to refer to a welcome party that left a particular location to meet a visiting dignitary or honored guest of some kind on the road and escort them back to where they were heading. It is precisely this meaning which denotes in its, uh, which this verb denotes in its other two New Testament occurrences. That is Matthew 25, 6 and Acts 28, 15. So it is most likely that Paul is here describing believers functioning as as a similar welcoming party to usher Jesus descending in the clouds from heaven the rest of the way to earth in triumph. 
In other words, it supports a post-tribulational over a pre-tribulational rapture. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 speaks of Christ coming like a thief in the night, surprising those who are not expecting Him. This does, not a, this does not support a secret rapture though because verse 4 goes on to explain that believers waiting in anticipation will not be surprised as others will. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3-7 through seven does indeed refer to signs that still must take place before Christ can come back finally, visibly and publicly, but that does not mean that the rapture is a separate earlier event as often argued. Verses 1 and 2 have just urged the Thessalonians not to believe reports that the end has already come in some secret, invisible way. Surely the best way Paul could have countered this if he believed in a pre-tribulational rapture would have been simply to say, quote, look you Christians are all still here. If Christ had returned or if His coming was even as immediate as some of you seem to think, you'd all have been raptured, end quote. But that's precisely what he does not say. How then do we explain the hope that the church has had in every century of the possibility of his, quote, imminent, end quote, return? To begin with, we must distinguish imminent from immediate. Despite the popularity of the views that declare, of the view that declares Christ could return secretly to rapture the church, quote, at any moment, end quote, There are no biblical texts that actually teach this. What they teach is that Christ is coming soon, quickly, and unexpectedly. We're taught to be ready for His return in all periods of history and in our lives. The signs that are yet to occur could begin and unfold quite rapidly at almost any moment. But that is not quite the same as saying that I must allow for the possibility for the Lord to return before I finish reading this paper. Revelation 3.10 speaks of the faithful Christians in Philadelphia being kept, quote, from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world, end quote. If this is looking beyond the first century to faithful Christians at the end of this age, and there is no certainty that this is the case, then it supports post-tribulationalism more than pre-tribulationism. Because the identical pair of Greek words used here for, quote, to keep from, end quote, appears elsewhere in the New Testament only in John 17, 15, where Jesus explicitly declares that His prayer is, quote, not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, end quote. Given John's authorship of the Apocalypse as well, it would be more likely that he would be talking about preservation of Christians on earth during the tribulation rather than escape from it via the rapture. Indeed, the rest of Revelation is consistent with this understanding. At first glance, it looks like the servants of God who are sealed on earth so that they are not harmed by the plagues of God's wrath during the tribulation are merely Jewish Christians. See Revelation 7, 1 through 8. But the numberless multi ethnic throng of Revelation 7, 9 through 17 is best understood as the literal equivalent to what is symbolically depicted as the new, true, and perfect Israel in the earlier verses of the chapter. Just as John hears Jesus described as the lion in 5.5, but looks and sees a lamb in verse 6, even though both images refer to Christ, so to hear he hears the number of those sealed intoned as 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, but looks and sees the numberless multitude. This group is then elucidated as, quote, they who have come out of the great tribulation, end quote. Language that more naturally suggests that they were formerly in tribulation and now removed from it rather than exempt from it altogether. The similarities of several of the trumpet and bowl judgments in chapters 8 and 9 and 16 to the plagues unleashed by God through Moses at the time of the Exodus supports this understanding too. Just as the Israelites were protected from God's plagues even before they ever left the land of Goshen, so too 
believers will not be harmed by God's end time judgments even while remaining on the earth. Cross-reference Revelation 9, 4, and 16, 2. 